Hello, my name is Elena Mejova, and I am a senior research scientist at the ISI Foundation in Turin, Italy. And today I would like to tell you about our latest work on mining uh, health misinformation uh, and tracking it on social media. So before there were alternative facts, there was alternative medicine. And it is a huge problem. So, for example, uh, measles, a deadly illness that has been wiped out from US and Europe, is coming back, uh, especially in places where people refuse to vaccinate their children. Homeopathy uh, and other scientifically disproven uh, remedies are allowed in many parts of the world. And in some places, they are actually a big business and they cause uh, illnesses to go untreated and even some people to die. And social media is not helping uh, with health crazes and dubious advice going viral all the time. But uh, if you just go online or on YouTube and search for a diet, you often get something very unhealthy. So the aim of my uh, recent work is to use NLP machine learning and network science to understand health misinformation in social media. And this is a first step to detecting potentially dangerous information and identifying people vulnerable to such messaging, uh, which could then be fed into future interventions and uh, prevention measures. So today I will tell you three stories each of which tells us about the nature of potentially harmful health-related information, um, especially on social media and Twitter in particular. So let's begin with Zika. Um, as you may recall, in early 2015, an epidemic of Zika virus affected several islands in the Pacific and South Asia, and then Brazil and spread to other parts of South and North America. And there are many uh, scary and uncertain news stories going around, including the link between microcephaly, uh, which is a small brain size in babies, and Zika, uh, and many other rumors. So we wondered whether we can track these rumors and see how response to them actually works. So to do this, we use a platform called Aider to collect uh, tweets mentioning keywords associated with this outbreak. And um, we found um, tweets that captured the initial scare about the virus, uh, which was peaking in February, and um, actually found a few peaks around the Olympics during the summer. So now we come to perhaps the most difficult question, what is a rumor? So whenever a statement is true or false, actually may change over time. Um, so for example, the speculation about microcephaly uh, that it was connected to Zika, at some point it was a rumor and then it was proven to be true. So we take a conservative approach and track only those rumors which were proven to be false by trusted authorities at the time of the collection. Uh, so we looked at lists of Zika rumors provided by the WHO and Snopes.com uh, Snopes um, and uh, to decide whether we wanted to use the topic as a rumor, we tried handcrafting high precision queries to formalize a concrete description of the idea. So some topics were too generic, like fish can help stop Zika, um, uh, whereas others we could actually formulate and selected these six topics. Then we used handcrafted queries to retrieve tweets matching our criteria uh, using search en uh, engine index made uh, using Indri. And uh, for some topics, we got tens of thousands and others only hundreds of tweets. So right away, we saw that just knowing that the right keywords appear in the tweet is not enough. So we use a crowd labeling task to distinguish a rumor from a clarification. And then we build a classifier to annotate the rest of the tweets within each topic. 
So once we distinguish between a rumor and a clarification tweet, we could track them over time. And what we found was a very bursty behavior with most rumors lasting only a few hours or days. So for instance, the first topic uh, got started by a report by some doctors in Argentina calling themselves physicians in crop spray towns. And they were basically claiming that increase in microcephaly causes um, uh, or is caused by lavricide that is used to fight mosquitoes, which was then picked up and used by anti-GMO uh, and other environmental groups. Another topic was also caused by an article that claimed that vaccines cause microcephaly, also published on an anti-GMO uh, website. And yet other topics were more continuous because they dealt with confusion around the flu-like symptoms being similar to those uh, of Zika. And here we actually see that the, uh, the corrections for uh, these rumors came at about the same time as the rumor itself, but often case the rumor would just go away on its own and would, be, uh, would take up a very short amount of time. So, of course, we tried um, building some tools to see if we can uh, automate this process. So, first, we check whether, given a topic, we could classify a tweet as rumor versus a clarification. So, we used many lexical and Twitter-specific features and eventually created a listing of trusted and untrusted domains. And we used uh, feature selection to select the most um, uh, useful features. Now, uh, using a random forest classifier, we actually achieved very nice performance. So easy task, but this is not what often happens in the real world. Often we don't know the rumor a priori. So can we train our classifier on other topics and uh, apply them to new ones. And the performance we see varies drastically. So for some topics, we have really abysmal performance and it is difficult to distinguish between a rumor and its correction when we haven't seen some of these topics. So creating a general purpose classifier without topical training data, I think is unfortunately very difficult. So now let's turn to a topic of cancer, which provides a very different angle on this problem. It's not bursty like infectious disease, but unfortunately it has a long history that affects a lot of people every day. So to take advantage of so many people that have been affected by cancer, there are many cancer cures which have been proposed. So this is a Wikipedia article on all the, all the um, cures that have been proposed and disproven or proven ineffective. Um, so of course there are things like herbs and diet, uh, some mechanical contraptions, and of course some spiritual advice. So many of these have been proven ineffective um, and we decided to track these. So, of course, there are some, um, uh, there's some messaging by the medical establishment that tries to uh, ward people away from these. Uh, often these are even scams, but they can never really truly capture the imagination of the public, uh, like the possible uh, the possibility of a cure. So we ask whether we can uh, identify people who may be more susceptible to propagating these fake cancer cures. So the design of the study is quite different than the past one because our focus now is on the people. So we want to track our rumor group, uh, those who have tweeted about one of these cancer cures and compare them to a control group. So as a control group, we, uh, we take uh, a set of users from a previous work that have posted about a cancer. So at least they're interested in the topic. 
And for rumor group, we track users who have posted on one of the cancer cure topics we identified on Wikipedia. And actually we used Cochrane Review and another resource uh, to identify topics. So we then actually took these topics to an oncologist who confirmed that these indeed would not help cure cancer. And note here that we are not looking at treating symptoms or making people feel better, uh, but the things that are claiming to actually decrease sizes of tumors or totally cure people. So then we apply several filters um, uh, on these people to make sure as much as possible that they're real people and that indeed uh, they are posting about topics again of interest. So here we apply um, uh, a crowdsourcing again to be able to distinguish uh, between tweets that are actually about claiming that uh, these cures are effective. And finally, we get the histories, uh, the tweeting histories of people who we select on both sides so that we can learn more about what kind of people, what other interests and behaviors they have. So we define our task is, um, so given that the user has posted something in the past, are they likely to eventually um, post about a rumor in the future? So for rumor users, we take uh, their history before their first rumor post. And for control users, we make a similar cut uh, but that is based on statistics from the rumor users. And we finally make sure that we have enough tweets to model both of them on. So using many of the features from the previous work, we uh, fed the data to a logistic regression classifier and actually got a fairly decent performance uh, in terms of R squared. Um, so because it's an exploratory exercise, we didn't report cross-validation results here. So interestingly, we basically found that the rumor users uh, tend to use longer words, um, but they have a uh, text that is easier to read. So we used some readability scores to measure this. They are more likely to talk about ingesting or eating something, more likely to share URLs and use tentative language. So things may be possible. And they may have higher posting entropy. So this is a way to measure uh, how regularly people post and maybe, um, so people who are accounts who post very regularly are more likely to be bots. So these people are actually more likely to behave like real people. Okay, so again, uh, knowing that we, um, the, the topic that we're studying, we can actually see uh, who is more susceptible to uh, propagating this information. So finally, we can turn towards a popular topic uh, which is sparking a lot of debate across the world, um, especially these days. And it gives us an opportunity to examine not just individuals, but the communities around pro and anti-vaccination debate. Um, so this work we com uh, recently completed with uh, my colleagues at ISI Foundation. Um, and what, uh, what the context is, is basically that since vaccines were invented, uh, people were actually uh, been campaigning against them. So this is a, a caricature of people getting kind of strange side effects when the cowpox was introduced. Uh, so from the very beginning, uh, there was a backlash against this uh, procedure. So we ask, uh, what are the properties of the vaccination debate on both sides of this debate? So what are the uh, properties uh, of this conversation and what do they mean for potential interventions that we can, um, can have? 
So this time we worked with uh, Italian data in particular. Um, so the benefit of this is actually that we're pretty sure that people who've been posting about it actually live in Italy. Uh, something you cannot say about English, for example. Um, so the data frame captured some discussion around vaccination requirements for children uh, attending schools. And uh, we, thus we have a few interesting spikes in our data set. So we begin by looking at users who we've captured by building a retweet network. So uh, a link exists between two users if one has retweeted another and we put a threshold of two on this network so that you have to be retweeted at least twice to be here. Um, so here, for example, you can see the plot uh, that we're using. Um, so we're using a directed layout, force directed layout. And you already can see that uh, there are several communities that emerge. But what we do next is we apply a graph partitioning algorithm following some previous work on controversies. Uh, so we basically try to, to the best of our abilities, um, kind of cut this uh, network in half. And what we find is that uh, these users can be separated very easily. Except for these people uh, in the middle, in blue, and uh, you may have difficult time guessing who these are, but they're actually pet owners. They are the people uh, having pets, uh, dogs and cats, and they're talking about the vaccination for their pets. And so they seem to be apolitical and collective, connected to both sides. So this is um, uh, so this is a very low labor intensive way to classify users because basically what we do once we have these two separations is that we uh, select a few users from both sides, examine their leanings, and then propagate this uh, opinion to everybody else in the cluster. Of course, one might say that this is. Um, too rough of an estimate, but actually when we checked manually this assumption, we, uh, we took uh, a whole lot of uh, individuals from both sides and labeled them, we found that this approach is 96% accurate. So using network properties uh, is actually a good way to determine which side of the debate our users fall. So these two clusters turned out to be very different. Um, if you look only at the most important users on each side, um, we find that the pro-vaccination side is more hierarchical. And the anti-vaccination one uh, consists of a tightly connected clique. So in fact, we checked manually the users in this clique and uh, they all seem to be real people even though usually they're anonymous, so they're not sharing their actual names, but the way that they're posting seems to be not like a bot. Another way that we can um, analyze these uh, communities is by looking at, uh, in, by looking at a community detection algorithm, and when we apply these algorithms, they actually also uh, separate these uh, to communities uh, automatically as well. So um, then we can look at different uh, kinds of networks. So here we are displaying a mention network. So who is mentioning who? And note that the side assignments, the colors here, come from the retweet network um, from this analysis, so they're not actually from this network, but from the previous one. And you can see that you, there, there are still the two sides, but there's a, they're a bit more integrated. But what we notice is actually it's because the anti side is mentioning the pro side. And after manual checking, we can reasonably say that it is to uh, attack the other side. 
So it looks like the anti-vaxxers are attacking the pro-vaxxers and mentioning them, but actually the pro-side is totally ignoring the anti-side. Whether it's a good idea to do that is questionable, of course. So uh, here we can also look at the uh, follow network uh, where users, uh, sorry, this one, uh, where users um, um, follow uh, different accounts. And this is much more about the general interest. So it doesn't have to be just about vaccines, but even then we can see that the network is quite separate. And what this implies is that not only are people talking about each other and following about each other from two different communities, but even where they got get their information is also different between the two communities. So as in previous uh, projects, we try um, to classify the stance of these users. So uh, we use a back and forth representation that we lemmatize and uh, apply several um, classifiers and find that indeed it's a, it is possible to, um, to predict on which side uh, these people are going to be just from the content of their tweets. Pretty easy. But remember that these users are the active ones that ended up in our retweet network. So they're um, active enough to be included in the network partitioning. But what if we consider users who are less engaged and are kind of in the periphery of the conversation and for whom we cannot um, do this very neat network classification approach? Well, first we find that um, it is difficult to annotate them. So even to us as humans, it was difficult to determine these people's stance on the matter. Even though they've tweeted about, about uh, vaccine, it was difficult to understand what exactly they were saying. Um, and our classifiers were actually uh, not able to perform as well. Uh, it's still better than um, majority baseline, but not by much. So it's still difficult to find these hesitant users. And it's actually very unfortunate because it's probably, it's these users that we want to target, right? Like the, we want to reach those who are as hesitant and not those who have already maybe strongly made up their mind. So from today's stories, I hope that um, I've convinced you that it's possible to track health misinformation and that it's very important. Um, but there are many things that uh, one needs to do to do it properly. Uh, you have to talk to experts and make sure you understand what erroneous information is exactly, because there are many gray areas, uh, especially in the fast evolving um, uh, situations like uh, pandemics, speaking of pandemics. You have to be um, as much uh, as possible focused on a particular topic so that you can have well-defined uh, things that you're tracking. Uh, you want to hand check your data to make sure that, um, that you are actually looking at what you're meaning to look at. So even though we used very high precision queries, we actually found a lot of these um, tweets to be clarifications instead of the actual rumor. And of course, you need to be um, aware of lots of context, political, cultural, community, other information sources. Uh, so this is a very complicated um, problem and very rich in possibilities for research. So thank you very much for your attention and for inviting me to this uh, wonderful uh, event. And I'm looking forward to your questions.